issue with women and estrogen dominance is not the actual level of estrogen, right? And it's not the actual level of progesterone, it's the ratio. And most of the time it's how you metabolize it. It'd be like estrogen's the amount that you charge on your credit card and progesterone's what you pay off. So if you charge on your credit card, $10,000 every month, but you pay it off, there's no issue. If I charge $1,000 and I don't pay it off, there's an issue. Right? <laughs> there's a problem. So, right. It doesn't matter the amount. It just matters the balance and how you get rid of it. And so that is another concept I was never taught in traditional training. I, ne- I didn't even really, again, in my menopause training and everything. And until that really dawned on me, I probably missed a lot with a lot of patients. So it's a huge thing for anyone with any estrogen pathology, like fibrocystic breast, endometriosis, fibroids, heavy periods, migraines, all the things. The ideal test, if everything was free, would be the cycle map, right? Because then you're getting 11 different readings because this happened to me last week, a patient came in and I told her to test on day 20 and she did, but guess what? She had a 35 day cycle. Oh yeah. That cycle. So what do you got? You got ovulation, you got crazy high estrogen, not enough progesterone because you got mid-cycle surge. So I, I see why people say, oh, we don't test hormones. Well, because you have to know these nuances, right? And your hormones fluctuate all the time. Well, that's true, right? We can all agree that, but that's even more why you have to be trained to know how to test. Dr. Tara Scott, oh my goodness. Welcome to the Root Cause Medicine podcast. So great to be here. I am really excited because I love talking all things estrogen with you. Everyone always has a million questions around estrogen and you just do one of the best lectures when you explain all the different types of estrogen and how estrogen gets detoxified, what estrogen does in the body. So we're going to dive in today. How's that sound? That's great. I love talking to you because there's few people that can geek out with me (laughs) on this topic. So Well, before we get started, why don't you tell everyone a little bit about yourself, where you practice, what you do, what you're involved in um, around hormones, and then we'll go to the questions. Yeah. So I am a traditionally trained medical doctor, MD, uh, spent a lot of years in OBGYN delivering babies, doing hysterectomies, and really through my own infertility journal, a journey when I had to like whack my body full of hormones and everything, saw that after I was done and got the kids that I got, there wasn't anything for women with hormone issues. So I first started studying about menopause and became a certified menopause practitioner. And then I kind of realized I really needed to know more than that. So I went ahead and did the fellowship through A4M mm-hmm. and got that board certification and then got a third board certification in integrative medicine. And it's kind of like the more you learn, the you realize the less you know. So I'm the eternal student that just loves learning about other things. Isn't that the truth, especially with estrogen, because I feel we, you know, we, there's a lot of controversy around estrogen, especially estrogen related to breast cancer. Everyone thinks estrogen, poor estrogen, like she's just super evil and she gets a super bad rap, which is so not true. It is, I mean, as you know, and as you talk about all the time, estrogen does a lot of good in the body. So can you start us off just by walking us through the different kinds of estrogens and, and what they do. I don't even think people know there are different kinds of estrogens. Everyone, we just say estrogen, but we, we know what we mean, but what do we mean? Right. We certainly aren't even taught this. I don't even think I was taught it in med school, let alone in my OBGYN residency. So obviously the point of the menstrual cycle is reproduction. And so you have an egg that's developing that produces estradiol. That's the most potent estrogen. And I always call like estrogen, like three sisters. And she's like the oldest, she's like the popular one, athletic and popular. So estradiol is the strongest, most potent, but really estradiol's 95% of it is produced from that developing follicle. So during your reproductive life, you have cycling of estradiol, as the egg is released. And again, if there's no conception, the whole thing starts again. Um, You have a different type of estrogen called estrone. And estrone, you know, that's the one that gets the bad rap, but it really depends on, you know, how much estrone you have in relationship to both progesterone and estradiol. Estrone has a propensity to cause growth in the breast and uterus. So you have, you know, receptors that cause growth, some that cause kind of a dampening of that effect. We call it like breaks, alpha, alpha accelerate, B breaks. So estrone seems to want to cause proliferation in the uterus and the breast. And estrone, you can have no ovaries and still make estrone. It comes from peripheral conversion from androstenedione via DHEA in the adrenal gland. So it always confused me. How does some women have a hysterectomy, get their ovaries out and feel fine? 
And how do other women go through natural menopause, still have their ovaries and feel awful and need estrogen? It just always confused me. And it's because of that estrogen. And then there's estriol, the weak little estrogen. I think of that as a youngest sister, you know, and really not produced in quantity unless you're pregnant. So a high quantity from the placenta, the fetal unit and everything, but only produced as a metabolic byproduct of estradiol and estrone. And the thing about estradiol and estrone, there's a what's called a bidirectional enzyme between those. So they can even what, swing it, having a, a lot of one can affect the other. So I never even realized, even in my early years of being a certified menopause pause practitioner, that those values were important. We're not taught to even look at estrone or think about that. And what are the good things estrogen does? Like, why, why do we have three kinds of estrogen? What do they do? Well, we, there's a fair amount of data, although we're not allowed to say it will prevent heart disease, there's a fair amount of data showing that, and if you even look at the incidence of heart disease, it's much higher in men than women up until menopause. I mean, when you hear that a male, you know, has a heart attack in his thirties and forties, it's, it's not surprising when you hear that a female does, it's very surprising. And so there is some protection that's conferred until menopause. And if you look at the incidence of heart disease, it's men before women and menopause, it kind of equals. And then it's women more over men in the 60s. So there is that protective effect of estrogen. We also know that it helps your bones. Um, and so that's important. Osteoporosis is a big disease process for women. And we don't think it's a big deal because you think skeletal health, but actually the death rate two years after a hip fracture is higher than 10 years after breast cancer diagnosis, but everybody fears cancer. Yeah. Estrogen is super important for that. But what's even more exciting is some of the studies, and, and these aren't randomized placebo control trials, but there was an observational trial that was out of the women's translational Alzheimer's movement that was 400,000 women over 65. And there was about a 60% reduction in Alzheimer's in these patients, which is crazy. So there's a lot of protection on the brain as well. So I think we're just still finding out everything. The problem is a lot of the data that we have 20 years ago is on synthetic uh, synthetic preparations of both estrogen and progestins, and those have their own risks too. So now that most people are kind of using the patches, which are what's called bioidentical or the micronized progesterone, and we're getting more data on those preparations, I think we're seeing more of the benefit. And when, well, actually, let me, st- let me take a step back. So for somebody who's not menopausal, what explain like through the menstrual cycle, like when is, when does estrogen make her debut? When does she go down? Like, how does estrogen rock and roll? Yeah. So yeah, again, as the whole purpose is uh, ovulation and reproduction, the brain is sending a signal via FSH for the follicle to grow. By day five, you have what's called a dominant follicle, which means one egg steps up and says, hey, this is my turn. I'm going to go this month. And then there's an inhibiting of the rest of the eggs. So they kind of like stay on the bench and the and the one egg is going to come in, right? I, I always talk about um, people swimming laps, you know, and the lifeguard is like FSH and the pituitary telling you to jump in and dive. So somewhere around the mid cycle, there's a surge from the pituitary gland, the egg is released. And then the shell of the egg for a simplified way of describing it becomes what's called the corpus luteum, produces progesterone, gets the body ready for pregnancy, progestation. And if the egg and the sperm don't meet, those hormones fall and the whole thing starts over again. So estradiol, it's kind of like a, what we call a biphasic. It goes up, it drops a little with ovulation, and then it goes up again at the, what's called the luteal phase, which is the second half of the cycle. So So estrone is kind of like a little bit of a surge in mid cycle, just because there's a surge in estradiol, but it kind of hangs out and it's kind of always there. So it's kind of like when you say that by basic, it's kind of like a controlled roller coaster. It should be controlled. <laughs> Not everyone right. feels like right. it's controlled, but it like she goes up and then down a little and then and then back up a little bit more again, which is why I think, um, you know, our female patients can say, I don't feel well or I feel hormonal just before ovulation or I, you know, they have, they're like, I feel bad at PMS is they're getting, they're on this roller coaster that may or may not be as controlled. Exactly. As they want. 
And, you know, I live close to Cedar Point, which is like the roller coaster capital of the world. And there's like one specific ride now that you made me think about that as like crazy high hill. And then it goes down and has the lower hills. That makes me think of estrogen. <laughs> it's like this crazy, crazy high. It's called the Millennium Force for anyone who has been to Cedar Point. That makes me think of the menstrual cycle. But you're right. It is up and down. And then, and then you can have at perimenopause, you have old eggs. What does that mean? That means they're hard of hearing. So that means that lifeguard in that chair is going to start picking up his megaphone because he might say, you know, your turn, your turn. And then all the eggs just sit there because nobody steps up because they can't hear because they're old, right? So then the lifeguard picks up his megaphone, starts shouting. So FSH goes up and then everybody, all those eggs are like, is he talking to me? Is it my turn? So they all start growing and making more estrogen. And it always confuse me. How do people make more estrogen as they age? why is there a higher incidence of twins in women as they get older? That never made sense to me. Now, of course, well, if the FSH is going up, people can release two eggs at once, one after the other. You can get what's called luteal out of phase cycles, which means one ovulates and then this other guy doesn't sit back down and then ovulates even before you've had that period. And I always thought, how could someone have a period 14 days later? There's no way you could mature an egg and ovulate by 14 days. Well, it's because it's left over from the last cycle and they're superimposed. So you've got all this estrogen estradiol, maybe even estrone. And these old eggs don't produce as much progesterone because they're old. So you have this discrepancy in estrogen and progesterone or estradiol and progesterone that's known as estrogen dominance. So actually let's talk about that. What, what are the common symptoms? Have somebody, I mean, I, I think a lot of people have heard that term. I know it's getting you know written about in mainstream um, yeah, media more like, and more. <laughs> yeah, more and more. We still have our doubters saying that doesn't exist. Oh, 100%. Always, <laughs> how does it not exist? Do we agree that endometrial hyperplasia exists? Yes. Do we yes. agree that fibrocystic breast exists? Yes. Well, how do you agree that there's no such thing as estrogen dominance? But I digress. So the most common symptoms, like I said, that I see most often is bleeding. I mean, bleeding, estrogen causes growth of the uterine lining. So I always think the heavier period you have, the more estrogen you have. And that seems to correlate. I mean, there are other things that go into that endometrium, and that's also the amount of progesterone. Progesterone will stabilize the uterine lining and cause apoptosis, which is programmed cell death. So you do have that, but also the more estrogen, you're going to have the more proliferation. Some women have all of a sudden new onset anxiety, that they're feeling like crazy palpitations. Um, insomnia is a big one too of estrogen dominance because progesterone relatively is less and progesterone generally helps you fall asleep. So the most common thing is those that shift in bleeding pattern. I also see quite a few women who present with migraines as well. Mm. Yeah, yeah, that's me. I definitely, I, not every cycle, but, um, so every since I hit 30, I have a history of migraines as a kid or headaches as a kid, they run in the family. And then once I hit 30, the menstrual migraines started and I was like, mm -hmm. fantastic. Thank you. Mm -hmm. <laughs> Thank you. So, and even though I do, you know, do hormones, I get hormones, even I still sometimes will continue to get them just because hormones can be screwed up easily. And and they're so unpredictable, <laughs> they're right? So, and it, you know, yeah, even I can be perfect, but the world around me isn't, and I can't yes. control that per se. Exactly, exactly. Yeah. You might be too young to like, I didn't have a problem. I didn't have a period since November and which is not that unusual at my age. And then I'm like, okay, it's time for me to do my test. And when, you know, like the next day I started, I'm like, oh, Murphy's law, oh, you're kidding. <laughs> you know, it's like, you think you get everything figured out. This is what I need. Let me do the test. And then everything changes. So I mean, getting people to understand that I cannot change their cycle, right? If we're trying to react and respond to what their body's doing, well, we can't prevent menopause. hundred percent of women go through it. Right. You know? Right. We can't prolong it. We can't really make you, I mean, we, we can make you ovulate in, the, in a fertility standpoint, but there's no reason to make it stop or make it go when you're not trying to get pregnant. Right. Right. Well, going back to testing, how do you test for estrogen dominance? Cause you know, people are listening to this going, that's me. I have crazy bleeding. And you know, my, I have fibrosis to breast and my breasts hurt and I totally have migraines. So how do I, what do I to ask my doctor for? Or what can I order myself? Yeah. I always get that question. Right. <laughs> it always makes me laugh and I do answer it. But the thing is, is like, if your doctor doesn't know what to order, they're not going to know how to look at the yeah. results because 
we can do blood testing, for example. I mean, that's somewhat considered the gold standard. When you go to an infertility specialist, there's no debate on whether or not hormone testing is valid, right? Because they do testing on day three to see what your, what's your ovarian reserve is. They also test on day 21 to see if you ovulated with your progesterone levels. So there's no dispute whether or not serum levels can assess hormones in that arena. I don't know why it doesn't translate to perimenopause. So what I do serum testing, we most often focus on mid luteal or day 19, 20 or 21. And you can check estradiol, estrone, progesterone, and your adrenal hormones in your, in your um, serum. Mm -hmm. But serum is somewhat limited because those hormones are bound to proteins. And so we don't know, do you have a lot of binding? Do you not have a lot? It's like, it's like your paycheck. How much went to your 401k and how much do you actually get? How much went away for taxes, right? So you, you the point, the gross and the net are different, right? So that's like bound and unbound. So that is important. So blood is great, but there's some limitation with blood. So, you know, we also like to do saliva testing at some point, but, you know, if you're on hormones, it can be skewed, it can be different, it can be helpful, but I feel saliva does a good job at that peripheral conversion of estradiol to estrone. So I like it for that. Also, I love the Dutch test because you can see you have your serum equivalent, you have your estrogen metabolism, because I think that is the biggest issue with women and estrogen dominance. It's not the actual level of estrogen, right? And it's not the actual level of progesterone, it's the ratio. And most of the time it's how you metabolize it. It'd be like estrogen is the amount that you charge on your credit card and progesterone is what you pay off. So if you charge on your credit card, $10,000 every month, but you pay it off, there's no issue. If I charge $1,000 and I don't pay it off, there's an issue. Right? <laughs> there's a problem. So, right. It doesn't matter the amount. It just matters the balance and how you get rid of it. And so that is another concept I was never taught in traditional training. I, ne- I didn't even really, again, in my menopause training and everything. And until that really dawned on me, I probably missed a lot with a lot of patients. So it's a huge thing for anyone with any estrogen pathology, like fibrocystic breast, endometriosis, fibroids, heavy periods, migraines, all those things. The ideal test, if everything was free, would be the cycle map, right? Because then you're getting 11 different readings because this happened to me last week, a patient came in and I told her to test on day 20 and she did, but guess what? She had a 35 day cycle now. Oh yeah. That cycle. So what do you got? You got ovulation, you got crazy high estrogen, not enough progesterone because you got mid cycle surge. So I I see why people say, oh, we don't test hormones. Well, because you have to know these nuances, right? And your hormones fluctuate all the time. Well, that's true, right? We can all agree that, but that's even more why you have to be trained to know how to test. So I I do all kinds of testing. It just depends on what I'm trying to figure out. It's, I was, I had a friend when speaking of you saying that I had a, um, she's at the time she was probably in her mid thirties and she texted me and said, I'm having all these symptoms. I'm going to go to my doctor. I'm you know, what should I ask for? So I told her and she texted me after the fact. And she said, my, my OBGYN told me that hormones are fluctuate too much and that she's not going to test me, um, and to just go on the birth control pill. And she was like, I don't want to go on the birth control pill. I don't to control my hormones, you know, like I want my own hormones. I would just like to test and and know where they're at. And I, and I really, this was several years ago. And I really thought about that of, oh, this, this is how it's taught. This is, this is, it must be the understanding, or at least how her OBGYN's understanding was hormones fluctuate too much. Therefore I'm not going to test them. Even in somebody who's not, who wasn't perimenopausal or of course menopausal. And I was like, you know, I think you need to get another doctor, not replace that doctor. I'm totally fine. If you like your OBGYN, totally stay, you know, that's fine. I like, I love my primary care, but my primary care does not understand hormones or a lot about functional medicine. And that's okay. She's there when I need her for primary care. Um, and so I said to my friend, I think we need to find you a hormone ex, somebody who understands hormones and can work through these nuances, just like you said. So I love that you said that because I think a lot of people listening are like, yeah, but I've asked my doctor, or I've asked my practitioner and they don't understand. They say, no, they push back. They don't get it. It's like, that's totally fine. If you came to me and asked me, you know, about the intricacies of cardiovascular disease and heart health, I'm so not your girl, (laughs) go find it. Go let's add somebody else to our little healthcare toolbox because that's not me, but hormones I can do just like delivering a baby. Don't ask me. 
Yeah. <laughs> you know, I, like not my area. Let's go find you an OBGYN. <laughs> yeah. But you, it's funny though, but I'm as a traditionally trained OBGYN, I tell people, listen, we are not taught how to do this. Mm-hmm. And I, um, you know, if you asked me about incontinence, I mean, that is within the OBGYN field, but that's a whole nother fellowship, urogynecology. You ask me about incontinence meds, incontinence, whatever. I'd be like, mm, like, like you said, I'm not your person. It's within my specialty for sure. It's mm-hmm. a subspecialty, but we have a very basic training of it, just enough to pass our boards. And then really that's it. You know, we don't even, I mean, they might have a rotation now and it's the same with hormones and they're like, well, who do I go to then? And then some people will be chiming in, you know, on TikTok. Oh, go to an endocrinologist. But in where I live, endocrinology is great at diabetes and thyroid, but they just, they don't do female hormones. I don't know if that's what it's the same in my area. It was, it's the biggest complaint diabetes for sure. Um, seems to be here, the, their biggest, um, focus or what, maybe what they continue to learn once they graduate, um, thyroid, some thyroid, um, but hormones, I, they seems to be a struggle. There's a big gap. And so certainly the PCP is not going to have mm-hmm. enough training at all. And so that there is that disconnect between, well, what do I tell my doctor to a- ask for? Well, we can tell you, like you said, like you told your friend, and then either the doctor is not going to order it or the doctor is going to order it. And they're going to say, oh, it's all normal because the range of normal from follicular to menopausal range pretty much covers any value that you're going to get <laughs> true. Like normal. Right. Yeah. So it's unfortunate for people. And it'd be like, is it, if I, you know, talk to the Uber driver in English and he was Spanish, I can speak a little Spanish, but you know what I mean? And so it'd be like, no amount of me saying anything is going to make them understand if they right. don't speak English. Right. So it's the same thing. Right. No, it's true. So I, that I definitely, you and I, I love it. Empower and we're empowering people add to your team, add your healthcare team. You, you don't, there's nothing wrong with your practitioner at all. They just weren't trained just like we weren't trained in certain things. And you just need to find right. somebody who, who keep is them trained. For your paps. Keep going to your OBGYN for your paps. If you need surgery, if you need an ablation, if you need a hysterectomy, you know, you got to go to your OBGYN. If you yep. want kids, definitely see your OBGYN. But the hormone piece, you know, more and more people are learning about this, which mm-hmm. is great, you know, mm-hmm whether it's because of physician burnout or people are actually interested in this approach, or a lot of people go into this when they have their own personal issues, you know, interest in hormones or whatever. So it's happening. And because of this, all this podcast that you're doing and social media, women are finding out more about it. So that this is the age that there's so much more available to patients than there was when I started doing this, you know, almost 20 years ago. Yeah. Which is really, it's really exciting. You know, it's really exciting and empowering. So with, with estrogen, there's a lot of ways you can screw it up. So if somebody's listening and they're like, okay, I'm going to, I'm going to, I'm writing this down. I'm writing down hormones. I'm going to look up saliva and Dutch testing. This is great. I'm going to ask my friends for, you know, somebody I could go see, but in the meantime, what, what's screwing up, what might be screwing up my estrogen that maybe I have some control over like everything from right. so the environment the or stress or all there's the things, the natural history of just the uh, up and down levels of of aging and perimenopause, then just like you said, the environment, you may have a perfect diet and you may exercise, you may have no stress, but we're exposed to all these chemicals that are endocrine disruptors that can mimic estrogen. There's certain chemicals that can prevent the enzymes that get rid of estrogen that can make them slower. Stress can slow that process down. Yeast can throw that process down. Your gut, your great analogy of the clawfoot tub, (laughs) you know, your gut is part of estrogen detoxification. And that's a huge part that even if we concentrate on hormones, if we're not looking at digestion and everything, that's going to be an issue. Your own genetic coding of those enzymes can slow things down. Extrinsic factors can also medications that you take can affect things. So it's crazy. I mean, I have yet to meet very many people that, you know, and I think that I have a pretty good, you know, clean out the Tupperware and everything, change the glass, you know, reusable water bottle, eat like clean, but my hormones are still messed up, you know? Yeah. Same. I have an air filter. I have a water, you know, over time, I'm not saying I went out and spent a million dollars on this stuff last year, but over the last five to 10 years, definitely air filter, water filter, predominantly organic. Um, we bought a grass, we eat meat. So we bought a grass fed grass finished cow. 
you have a freezer, you know, like we just, we'd same thing, switch to glass, et cetera, my skincare, my makeup, my detergent, yeah. my got to clean my, and still I had a migraine last week because <laughs> I'm my cycle. And I was like, damn it. <laughs> it makes you more relatable because you go through it. So you yeah. can, help, you can help people more. Yeah. That's why I'm going through it. Yeah. Yeah. It's funny. Cause I will have, I do, I don't know if you get this. I'll have pushback from people who are like, well, if you know, if you can't, if, a, if you can't, stop your migraine, then, you know, I have no hope. I'm like, oh no, no. I used to get a migraine every cycle, every cycle. And I don't get a migraine every cycle now, but I do get them sometimes it's, you know, we all have weak points. Some people it's their stomach. Some people it's their joints. Some people it's their upper respiratory sinus stuff. Some people it's their lungs and, you know, headaches have always been a, been a weak spot for me. So if I'm, whether I bring it on or not, it's going to be a headache. So yeah. Even hormone people can get headaches. Yeah. <laughs> we're not immune. We're not, we're For not sure. perfect, but I do want to talk about the estrogen metabolism or estrogen detoxification. Cause I think that really, really gets people excited and also super confused. And my favorite are when, when w- uh, people ask, um, what estrogen detoxification should I do? Like what seven day cleanse should I do? And I'm like, <laughs> Oh, well, actually, your estrogen goes through detoxification 24, seven, 365, right? It like, doesn't take off for your birthday or Sunday or, you know, yeah. holidays, like you, it never stops. So we're just trying to optimize it. So can you start at the beginning and explain it, how you explain it? So all of things, including estrogen, whether it's chemicals or um, toxins are going to be detoxified in the liver. And generally there's two phases. The first phase is generally cytochrome P450. So there's three different enzymes that are involved for estrogen specifically. So estrogen's floating around and there's a chemical reaction that changes it, that makes it this what's called intermediate metabolite. And then there's a second phase. So it depends on testosterone might have a different second phase or other hormones or other toxins might have second phase. For estrogen, it's methylation. Um, there are some other options like glucuronidation, sulfation. So the second phase, it's like estrogen gets tied up in a package and then goes down the chute into the gut or into the liver, right? So it's floating around, it's changing and it becomes more polar, gets into the urine or it goes down the slide into the gut where potentially those bad bacteria, not bad bacteria, but overgrowth, those partiers can open up that box and send some of that estrone back into circulation via beta glucuronidase. So that was another piece that I never really understood till later, you know? So it's, I'd say it's like sweeping your floor, mopping your floor, and then you've got the back door, which is glutathione. That's the Roomba that comes on, you know, picking up any crumbs after all that. And then you, again, like I said, you have to slide down to the gut. So it's really complicated, obviously. And this is something that happens in the cell all the time. Like you said, yes, the gut is part of it, like phase three estrogen detoxification. So people, when they say of doing detoxes, you know, you got to cleanse the gut before you cleanse the liver. If you're not pooping every day, you're going to get backed up. No sense doing a liver detox because where's it going to dump into, right? So people think of detoxing as that, as maybe your gut detox, which can help if you're somebody who doesn't have good digestive function. But for estrogen, as you said, it's, it's happening moment to moment, day to day, cell to cell all the time. Mm -hmm. And it's so, it's just so fascinating, like the human's body, you know, like how complicated this is. And so we have genetic coding of each of those enzymes. So they could be faster, they could slower. We have things that inhibit, we have things that augment. So, so many variables for those those phases. For example, the first phase can be improved by eating cruciferous vegetables or berries. So we hear about that a lot with changes in the diet. We hear about using supplements like DIM, but some people already do that normally. That's why a test like the Dutch is great because if you already have a lot of that green metabolite or the 1A1 pathway, then DIM isn't going to add much to you. I mean, yeah, you can eat broccoli if you love it, but you'd have to eat about five pounds of broccoli a day to make move that needle. Which is a lot. (laughs) That's a lot. The second phase being methylation, there's so many things. I mean, usually it is, yes, just COMT, but it seems like there's so many extrinsic factors that affects that as well. And so the genetic coding is just one piece of it. Then the epigenetics of it can affect it as well. So you can, you could identify your genetic SNPs and see how you are, or you could do, I used to do something called a methylation profile, which is a blood test. Yeah. 
components of the methyl cycle. I don't really do that that much anymore, but you could do something like that. Um, and so everybody has a different kind of speed and even within the same person, like the patient I just saw has an aromatase snip. Yeah. So she's surgical menopause. She needs desperately testosterone, but she dumps it into estrogen. Yeah. So it took me a, the longest time to figure that out because it's not really on most genetic panels and it's not really obvious. I couldn't figure out why she either had way too much estrogen or not enough. There was never in between, same with testosterone. She was either way overdosed on testosterone or way below. And I could never get her until I figured out, I can give it a aromatase snip and put her on the nastrozole and she's better, but it's still been an up and down. Now, why would somebody post-menopause all these years still yeah. have this up and down? Well, something about her makes her fine, 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 accumulate. I don't know what it is, you know? Yeah. Whether yeah. It's stress, whether it's what it is, like we have not found out what the, tr- the exact triggers are yet. Which is, and I, I think it's really important for, you know, you mentioned obviously the cruciferous vegetables, which are great. That's your broccoli, your kale, your cauliflower, et cetera. And you mentioned dim and, and you know, me, I always say, you know, I get really uh, irritated at practitioners who just give dim out like Oprah gives out cars Yes, because dim only moves the meter in that phase one. But it just, as you, just, as you said, if you, if you're moving the meter in phase one, if you're just pushing, pushing, pushing against the liver and you're completely constipated or, you know, you're something's going with your kidneys or you can't get it out of the system, then it's only going to do more harm than good. I don't think people realize the serious ramification. Uh, yes, there's supplements, but I mean, they're big time. They move these enzymes and not only affect estrogen, but a lot of other uh, chemicals as well. I was actually in an environmental medicine conference last weekend and they were talking about um, the uh, the way that DIM, the supplement DIM works. DIM, by the way, for listeners, stands for diindolmethane. It, it uh, attaches to a receptor. It's called an aryl hydrocarbon receptor for the nerds out there. And but so do a lot of other things, chemical like uh, polyaromatic hydrocarbons in our in our air in our environment, PAHs, which are very toxic. They also get affected by this, and so everyone's popping DIM like it's candy for estrogen, not realizing it's affecting their PAHs. Now, again, it, it's, it's the issue is if they can't move on to the phase two and the phase three, then not only do you have estrogen issues, but you have polyaromatic hydrocarbon issues. And so that's why I love that you say everyone's so individual. Um, instead of just piling on a bunch of nutrients you read about in a blog, you really should see somebody who knows what they're talking about. It's Cause God forbid you make yourself worse. Yes. You may feel better initially, but I, a lot of commenters, a lot of DMs from people who were like, oh yeah, that was me. I read a blog or I read, you know, listen to a podcast and they said, take dim or take this thing. And I felt great for a couple of weeks. And then, wow, I felt terrible. I was like, yeah, you probably overloaded a pathway and didn't realize the next pathway was stuck. <laughs> I'm sure you yeah. see that all the time. Yeah. And, and, and multiple different pathways, the same thing with methylation. They read Ben Lynch's book and they're like, oh, I got to take this. Although yeah. he's not a proponent of overloading supplements. He he's totally. Like, yeah. He's great. It, right. Yeah. But they read some of his stuff and they're like, oh, I need this and I need this. And I did the same thing to myself. I overmethylated myself for a while, you know? So um, it's so, and it's not like we're trying to have a secret hormone club that no. we, <laughs> we have to see every patient, you know what I mean? It's like, cause I get asked that a lot. I'm like, it's not like I'm trying to be like exclusive about this advice or whatever. It's just like that I cannot give you advice over, well, I wouldn't give you advice over TikTok anyway, but you know, it's like, it's, you just can't right. without knowing, knowing all this. Right. Actually, I'm a great example I'll be in full transparency, obviously. So I used to, as you, as you know, but I used to be the medical director of Dutch for years and years and years since the beginning and have transitioned over to Rupa health. Well, because I worked at Dutch perks of the job, I got free Dutch testing all the time. So my second phase, my what's called, um, methylation that you said, uh, the enzyme there is COMT is slow. And I had high estradiol often and, but I had not yet done the third phase, which is stool testing, which is where you poop in a cup for science. So recently I did a stool test and I realized, uh, even though I worked really, I did, um, had done it in the past, but it, within recently that enzyme that you mentioned, cal- or, uh, calcium, uh, calcium or not calcium deglucrate, yeah. beta glucuronidase was elevated. So my, just as you described, my packages of estrogen were getting opened and my estrogen was floating back in, is floating back in through my body. So not only 
was that putting a lot of pressure on that methylation? I don't genetically, I don't inherently have issues with my COMT, but I think what was happening was I was getting all the, my estrogen packages opened, like all my Amazon packages were being opened and then put back out <laughs> into circulation. And that puts pressure back on my methylation enzyme. So I now, now that I'm more aware, uh, obviously focusing harder on the gut as opposed to methylation, um, which is, which is the more individualized thing for me. Yeah. And as you know, there is data PubMed articles that document that because oh, hundred percent. Yeah. We've been dissed about with traditional practitioners. There's no way your gut can send back estrogen into your circulation. Yes. It does not back up. Uh, there's pub. I just did a quick Google search and a bunch mm-hmm. of, you know, came yeah. back gluconeogenesis and estrogen levels specifically in breast cancer patients and non-breast cancer patients. So there is data there that does that back that up, but we just don't know about it. We're not taught right. that. And there's no, um, there's not a lot of money in the arena, right? If there's no pharmaceutical that's about to be developed, or there's no procedure, or there's no, it's not groundbreaking against something current. They're not, you know, the NIH doesn't throw a lot of money there, um, and which is unfortunate. Which is unfortunate because these things would be could be really helpful for a lot of folks because estrogen, you know, as much as we love it when out of, when it's roller coaster is off its rocker, then it really does cause problems and symptoms for sure. And I think that, you know, just the people that are going to listen to this podcast, I mean, they're going to get to the point that it's worth it to them to figure this out and mm-hmm. feel better and, you yeah. know, the way the pros and cons and the price points of doing testing or not doing testing. Yeah. And this arena lets us, you know, reach a lot more people. Yeah. Yeah. And I also like that you mentioned the nutrients involved in the liver and stuff, because I don't think, I don't think people realize that to run the liver, like the organ, our organ, the liver requires a lot of cofactors and cofactors are things like your B vitamins and choline, right. And, and glycine and, and all these folates and all these things, magnesium that we get from our diet. And so on the one hand, if you're not eating it, the problem, and if you're not digesting, breaking them down and then able to digest them, then we have another problem. And, um, that went way back when I remember seeing this great, beautiful graph of a liver. And it was like, here are all the nutrients used in all these different steps. And I thought, oh, gosh, the liver requires a lot of nutrient, like cofactors here, right? A lot of vitamin and they come from our diet. And uh, when we do get the naysayers who say, you don't have to do anything about your liver. Your liver's got it figured out on its own. It's like, well, thank goodness it does to a big degree. But for a lot of people, if they're, they're not eating a nutrient dense diet, if they're not able to break it down and absorb it for whatever reason, then they are going to struggle with detoxification. Cause they just, you know, if you don't have, if you're B12 deficient, you're B12 deficient and it's not going to help your liver out now, is it? And I don't know a lot about environmental medicine, um, but one of the things I have heard is our soil just is not the same. Yeah. So you could think you're eating the, yeah. you could think you're eating the pe- perfect diet, or you could have these defects you don't realize. So you could have a high, higher need for bees than the RDA, which was developed, you know, almost a hundred years ago or whatever, 80 years ago. Yeah. So yeah. It, what, you know, you could be getting the RDA requ- requirement because there's, there's the, the, vitamin proponents, then there's the people who are vehemently against vitamins. If you're just peeing that all out, just people trying to sell you that, or, you know, somewhere in the middle is, is the truth. But mm-hmm. I think those are all great points is, you know, it might not be in our diet. You might think you have the great diet. You might have a higher need because of a genetic susceptibility. It's not in our soil, you know, what was depleted before. So, you know, that's something that I don't know a lot about at all. It's a fascinating aspect of medicine. No, I would agree completely. I would agree completely, which is why um, I think it can be a real struggle for a lot of people One, they're just trying to find an expert to help them. And two, there's, there's a lot to know, but I am just so, so thrilled that you came on today to talk about estrogen. So in the final question, given that this is the root cause medicine podcast, and we have been talking all things, estradiol, estrone, a little bit of estriol. So what are your top two or three kind of practical, tactical things you like to talk with your patients about or that you would like to leave everybody with today around estrogen? Well, you know, there's a couple pearls, obviously. One of the things is you really just need to know, test, don't guess, right? I'm a big proponent of testing. And if, even if it's just traditional blood testing. So I just think I, I play this little game with myself that I can go through an airport and be like, 
high estrogen, <laughs> high testosterone, you know, but you, it's not always that obvious. There might be somebody who's thin and has crazy high estrogen. You didn't anticipate it or whatever. So I definitely think, you know, it's a plug for whatever type, type of testing you have available for yourself. And then there's just the pillars of health. I mean, we, I think as Americans, we had just have not prioritized sleep, stress management. I don't say stress reduction anymore, but stress management and just eating clean and just moving your body like those pillars. Those are really important for estrogen metabolism. And so I think we forget how much estrogen is affected by stress or is affected by sugar or mm -hmm. alcohol. Alcohol. I was just going to yes. bring up alcohol. <laughs> I know. So, I mean, it's true. And so again, it's not like you can never have any drinks. It's just like you got to figure out what's right for your body. How much is, can you tolerate without backing everything up? So those are the basic things that I think, you know, if people were able to even just do that, if they couldn't get to a provider, could you just overhaul? And we talked about plastics and environments and organic food and grass-fed beef and all those things can get you pretty far before you even have to take a supplement or a hormone. Yeah. Yeah, absolutely. I've even had people in my DMs and you might have too, who've said I've done things like switched out to organic, hundred percent organic tampons and pads instead of, um, you know, one that's maybe plastic applicator or, you know, covered in scent, you know, some of them are scented or the, the bleached cotton. And they've said, my cramps went away. Like my period's not heavy anymore. My cramps went away, just switching to hundred percent organic. Like I did not realize every time I yeah. Inserted one up there that I'll, I was just absorbing all of that. And I just little baby steps like that can be phenomenal. Yeah. So sure. that's great. Well, thank you again so much for being on the show today. I know estrogen is such a hot topic and people want to hate her, but we shouldn't because she does a lot of good in the body. So where sure. last thing, where can people find you? How can people learn about you? Uh, obviously you mentioned TikTok. Yeah, TikTok because sure. of you. <laughs> I know TikTok is addicting. I know it's a hormone guru. I'm hormone guru. And I, I'm not a super creative person, but that is where I can have, let my creativity come out. Like you, you, you're great at the reels too. So, you know, the, the TikTok, I promise I will not dance, but um, that is a great place to look at things. Instagram is revitalized med or Dr. Tara Scott um, and website revitalized med or Dr. Tara Scott as well. Two of those as well. And I have a lot of my YouTube channel, Tara Scott MD. It's a little bit easier to search. The TikTok's very hard to search. I do have playlists, but very hard to search for what you specifically want. So YouTube is probably easier to get if you have a specific thing you're looking for. And your practice is in Ohio and is open to patients, correct? Your practice? Yeah. So we are um, revitalized forum health Akron right now. We're in the little bit of midst of a rebranding, but revitalize or form health Akron will get you there. And, um, we have nurse practitioners that can see patients. We, we, we are probably hiring somebody else in the near future and myself as well. So we are, we're still seeing new patients in Ohio and I have a medical license in Florida as well. So I can wow. see telemedicine patients in Florida. Right. Well. Wonderful. Amazing. Well, again, thank you so much. Your knowledge is everything so helpful and I just really appreciate it. Well, thanks for all you're doing, trying to educate everybody as well. All right. Well, have a good day. Bye. Bye.